Good day, and welcome to IMPACT, a community affairs discussion program from the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. I'm Jeff Frederick. In 1950, the world's population was 2.5 billion. Today, it's 7.1 billion. By 2050, it's estimated to be over 9 billion. This presents any number of tremendous challenges, energy, education, healthcare, and of course, food. In part, the feeding of 9 billion people will require extensive planning, improved technology, and sustainable agriculture. Some of the success in meeting those 2050 needs is dependent on today, and in particular, skillfully producing food, textiles, and fuels in a way that protects the future, as well as the ecosystem, animals, organisms, water sources, and environment that we need to thrive. This way, we all eat. Some of these techniques are already here and in operation in southeastern North Carolina. No-till farming, biodiverse soils, water conservation and management, cover crops, integrated pest management systems, can all help produce an agroecology conducive to current needs and future challenges. Joining me today to talk about sustainable farming, organic farming, farm to table, and other current and future trends in agriculture are Millard and Connie Locklear and Davon Goodwin. Welcome everyone. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Tell us a little bit about how you got your start in farming. You've all done interesting things other than farming. So yes, my start is kind of unusual. After being injured in Afghanistan, I uh, came to UNC Pembroke, uh, graduated, and then found myself kind of yearning to be back in agriculture. And so in 2013, I became a farm manager. And from there, you know, came my farming journey. And now uh, I'm owner and operator of OTL Farms located in Laurenburg, Scotland County. Connie and Miller, you all have an interesting story too. Yes, sir. Uh, we uh, are fifth generation farmers on, on our farm that we inherited. Um, both of us have worked off the farm most of our adult lives. Uh, Millard has retired and came back to the farm full time. I'm still working part time, but I am a, still a part. I mean, I'm working full time, but I'm still a part time farmer. Farming's in my blood. It's in my heart. It's something that I've always done. As a child, I was raised up on a farm, and I thoroughly enjoy planting and growing and just feeding people. I was the same way. I was, uh, we stay on the farm that I was born on, I would think. And uh, I'm the first generation that left the farm to make a public living. I worked for DuPont for 37 years before I come back to the farm. So you retired to come back to farm. Yes. So you're working harder now than when yes, you were at DuPont. Uh, <laughs> yes, a whole lot more. Yeah. Well, um, let's talk about some terms. Uh, okay. What's the difference between organic and non-organic farming? Let's start there. Organic farming is a, a, it's a USDA operation guidelines that they produce to give details how you should produce food organically. And every person that does that has a, a NOP, which is a national operation procedure that he would follow. And anything you want to violate from that procedure or change in that procedure, you have to get permission from a, your auditor and everything. So there's a very specific set of guidelines and you need to follow mm -hmm. those guidelines. Yes. What are some examples of a couple of those organic farming guidelines? It's the, it's the, well, the biggest thing is the amount of fertilizer, the type of fertilizer you use. You know, it has to be natural based fertilizer. But here in the last two years, they've changed and allowed a certain amount of synthetic fertilizers added to the systems. Because they, in the last year, they recognized hydroponic and aquaponic as part of the organic. You can't get something certified as, in that field. Well, up, uh, up to last year, you could not have anything synthetic approved. So, how extensive are the rest of those guidelines? Yeah, they're pretty extensive um, because the fact of using non um, man made you know, chemicals or fertilizers is, is strenuous on a farmer, but also to meet those guidelines, there's a lot of record keeping that has to uh, go on on the farmer side as well. Yeah. So, you have to keep extensive records, yes, and anytime you're putting anything into or on top of the soil, you have to know exactly what's in that. Uh, your, yes. your label readers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. MSDA. Mm -hmm. The MSDA sheet, this is a material specification data sheet. It's, if you get it from the manufacturer, it's like compost. If we 
producer can't put it ourselves. We got a, a guideline we got to follow. He's got to uh, stay above 140 degrees for so many days, and it's easier to purchase a compost than it is to have a facility sell side to make your own compost. Mm -hmm. Now, how are all of these organic guidelines monitored? Is there somebody who come interacts with you on a regular basis? Uh, we are uh, GAP certified. They come in once a year and they uh, monitor your paperwork. They, they, they look through all your paperwork. Uh, they monitor what you're doing in the fields, how you gather, how you plant, how you package. So it goes back to that record keeping. As mm -hmm. farmers, it's you have to be keeping. exhaustive and detailed record mm -hmm. keepers. Yes. Absolutely. I, um, we got a letter this year from FEMA. Also, you know, the federal government has developed a no set of guidelines. And FEMA will just send us, uh, FISMA. FISMA send us about seven pages. We just had to sign and date that. We, uh, to the best of our knowledge, we did not violate any of these guidelines. And all of it pertains to organic format. Now, are all of you certified? No, we, yeah. we don't. We're not certified and we probably won't be. Uh, yeah. I practice more sustainable farming, yeah. which um, for me and what I grow is uh, to me better. And also when I look at, you know, the impacts financially, because something about sustainable farming is the financial side. Mm -hmm. And so I don't feel like for my consumer base that that label really matters too much. I think they want to know more about the practices that we're doing than the label to certify a product. So let's talk about that term, sustainable. How is that different mm -hmm. from organic? Well, it's, it's different in a way of the inputs that we use. Um, organic based is, is for financial reasons, it's a, it's a lot higher. You know, we get sustainable agriculture, we still, we still use some of the same guidelines, but we're not so extensive on what we use. And so we use mostly things that are natural, occurring, uh, non, any non-man-made you know, fertilizers uh, or pesticides or herbicides. And so that's one of the, the big differences that differentiate the two. So it's hard to keep those differentiations separate so that when you're using your, y'all certification, you can make sure that that label of organic is. Right now, we're in our first year of transition. It's a three-year program. So they took, accepted our transition procedure. So right now, we're still in the transition. We, it could be a year or two years. Added an auto come with all of our books, whether he'll certify us or not. Right now, we're not certified, but we have been transed over to the transition plan. So you all are, uh, are organic and you're sustainable. Yeah. Um, what are you growing on your farms now? What, what, what was this cycle like? Uh, right now we've got collards. Uh, we've got two different types of kale. We've got some lettuce and some uh, bunch of onions, um, leeks. We started some leeks and rhubarb. So we're going to see and chard. So we're going to see how the season goes with some of those things. Yeah. And we'll be implementing a lot more in the next month or so. So have you guys had to make um, specific crop decisions based on how wet it has been? Oh, yes, yes. absolutely. It's delayed mm -hmm. crops. Mm -hmm. And um, when will you transition from what you're growing for a winter crop into what you're doing for the spring? So for my operation, we're perennial based, so we grow muscadine grapes, and so it's perennial. So my seasons are not, they don't change what we grow as far as the grapes, it changes our management practices. So now we're getting our soils ready to start a new three acres of planting. So now we have to get ready to lime and get uh, all of our soils ready, you know, for this spring planting. Yeah. So there's an extensive amount of soil chemistry, I guess. Yeah, yeah because uh, the sand hills, I mean, soil pH variable, you know, so right now uh, our soil is pretty acidic, you know, so I mean we're like at 4.7, we need to be at 6.2 to 6.5, and so without that optimum pH, you know, you have low productivity. And are you all on your farm doing a lot of soil testing like that as well? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we cut our farm into 16 different small plots, and each plot we cover crop it, and then we'll do the specification checks like Devon's talking about, the pHs what we're going to put in there next year. Some crops is higher pH or less pH. Cool, which one you're going to run. You know, if you have a, out of the tomato family, the night shadow family, you don't have a higher pH. So whatever you're growing that particular season, you have to have a specific soil recipe as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. So how you're farming perennial and you're making some fairly Vegetables. regular changes. When, yeah. when do you have this all mapped out in terms mm -hmm. of yes. this spring I'm doing this mm -hmm. and then in the fall? How, how does it tell? 
Take us inside the thought process right. of how you guys make those well, decisions. Well, the procedures and the transition in your organic transition plan that you got to do a five-year projector on each plot. So I already got a book project that I, what I would have in the, each plot. So you know what you're growing in 2024, 2023 yes. already. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. everything. Now, like the bond said, the, the difference between organic and sustainability formula. I would rather sustainability, but there's not a market uh, for that. Get, get in the, yeah, wholesale markets. Wholesale markets require that you do a lot of extra stuff. So yeah. for the crops you're growing, mm -hmm. sustainability mm -hmm. makes sense for you. For the crops that you're growing, yeah. organic makes mm -hmm. sense for you. The Food and Drug Administration, um, you know, they don't recognize sustainable farming. You, they still look at that as conventional. So to, to say that you had something chemical free and it ain't in a transition organic plant or, trans, or organic, it don't mean nothing in the price. So a minute ago, one of y'all mentioned cover crops. Talk about them. What do they do? How do you make a cover crop decision? What do you do when that crop has reached fruition? When you do your soil pH is a check and your soil nutrition check, you look at the amount of nematodes and other different uh, microbiologists in there, in the soil. And so some cover crops like mustard deteriorates nematodes. And then if you got a, a low nematode problem, you might want to go with a cereal rye or nitrogen efficient, you know, put some nitrogen into the soil. Or if you got a hard pan structure, amount of clay, you might add some daikon radishes or some form of that. So you all are growing specific crops not only to change the soil, but the amount of microorganisms that are in there. And for mm -hmm. us, our planting begins years uh, before because it takes three years for us to get a crop. Yeah. And so we're three years out, you know, so we have to make sure that when we're making decisions, we're not just thinking about the year that we're planting, but three years out. Yeah. And so when our cover crops, we use a lot of things to um, not just add fertility, but to maintain, especially during these wet seasons, you know, so uh, we normally will do uh, crimson clover will come up in the spring. That's when it fix nitrogen in the soil, you know, to, so it kind of helps with the financial part because it's naturally occurring. We don't have to bring in so much mm -hmm. off the farm. Um, and then we use different things like daikon radish to break up soil compaction since we've been driving tractors in the field. So there's a lot of different things that can help the farmer, you know, when it comes to cover crop, cut down on a lot of um, cost. Yeah. So what happens when the cover crop is bloomed or is as full as it's going to be do you put it back into the soil do you take it out what is there yeah so the way we terminate our cover crop is we just mow it yeah. you know we'll, we'll mow it um, we try to in a vineyard setting i mean it's, it's really no till you once you plant your grapes you're not tilling at all you know so we try to um, either crimp it with a roller uh, in the front of the tractor or we will uh, just use a bush hog and just terminate it that way so th there's another interesting term, no-till. What's the difference between a no-till farm and a till farm? The biggest difference is, um, again, it just goes back to the type of equipment you use. If you far do traditional farming, it's the equipment that you use is designed to go into soft ground, town, sound that has been uh, tilled to make it easier to plant into. You got a formation bed there. The no-till is not planting nothing at all. I mean, no tilling of, of the soil and use a, a machine designed to plant into hard pan-based type substance. So for example, for the spring, you would cut your cover crop down or, or crimp it with a roller, and then you would plant real, literally right on top of that cover crop. Mm -hmm. yes. And that does a lot for you. Number one, it's gonna suppress weeds that's gonna grow up, and also yeah. it's for water retention. Mm -hmm. Right now, it doesn't seem like we need water retention, but- Boy, does it not <laughs> seem like we need water retention. Uh, but come summer, you know, when it's hot and dry in July and August, mm -hmm. You know, that yeah. bed that you created with uh, crimping it down will hold down moisture. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So your uh, use of cover crops is dealing with soil, it's dealing with the biodiversity of, uh, of the soil, it's dealing with the pH and the mm -hmm. acid factor. It's also mm -hmm. helping you to retain moisture with the next crop. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, and, the big, and then the financial part of cover cropping, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, when you can put it, you know, a legume down that's going to fix nitrogen, nitrogen is very expensive to buy outside of the farm. And so whatever you can do naturally to mitigate your costs makes your farm more profitable in the long term. Yeah. So how do you fertilize on a sustainable versus an organic farm? What um, sustainable farm allows you to not be required to monitor the, the, the microbiologists in that compost. As long as you they allow 180 days, as long as it's been taken away from non-animal traffic on that compost, when, 
for 180 days, you can plant food into it. Now, some of the organic farms require up to a year. It's cool which, which uh, auditor you got. Some auditors will not even let you use it at all, you know, certain animal base. So do you, do you fertilize at a certain time after the seeds have been put in? Is that how, how regulated, how orchestrated is that whole process? So for us, for grapes, you know, it's, everything is time sensitive. You know, so we will, um, we normally buy our fertilizer. You know, we, we buy, you know, man-made fertilizer depending on um, the season, you know, depending on um, really the, the crop Pacific, you know, profitability of, you know, either using a non-synthetic uh, or using, you know, something that we create on the farm. And so we're normally, before we um, will look at the crop, you know, we've done a soil sample and the soil sample tells me exactly what we need to do as far as fertilizing. And so we normally fertilize a couple months before the grape actually blooms. So when it does bloom, the, whatever we're feeding is ready for the plant to uptake it. And Connie, you guys have so many different kinds of crops mm -hmm. um, that you're growing. Do you have a different fertilizer schedule for each crop? Uh, we do, we do. Like uh, collards, when we set collards out, once we set them out in the field, two weeks later we'll go by and side dress them. And two weeks after that, we'll, we'll use like a, a fish emulsion, a liquid fertilize. And then later on in the season, if it needs more, we'll add more fish emulsion, yeah. no more side dressing, anything like that. And like for lettuce, we're doing lettuce in the, in the uh, hoop house. Um, that uh, two weeks after it was uh, planted, once it emerged, we done fish emulsion. Hmm. And then every two weeks after that. Until so you, it's you have a schedule, mature. do you, how often are you in and amongst the field saying, I think we need to change the schedule a little bit, I think we need to fertilize more, or this is really, you know, we're, it's going to reach harvest time faster than I thought. How, how often, what is, the, what is the art of farming that allows you to yeah. be out in the soil and make those decisions? Well, it's like Devon said, each plant we know the nitrogen needs. You know, if you got a, a collard plant, that's 80 unit to 100 units of nitrogen. Your peas and your butter beans only need about 30 or 40. So as you develop your plants, like our cover crop plan, we know if we put a crimson clover out there or some more expensive um, legumes, they, they could put in from 60 to 100 plus units of nitrogen in that soil, so you would not have to fertilize at all. Mm -hmm. But you've got to be very careful what crop you put in out of that uh, cover crop, because certain plants take up too much nitrogen at one time. That's when we like she was saying, go back and regulate, put it out in, in two to three week cycles. In increments. All right, so that's the fertilizer side of it. What about the pest side of it? You go out there and something's obviously been eating the grapes or eating something. What, what can a sustainable farmer do? What can an organic farmer do in terms of dealing with that? So we use a practice called integrated pest management. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we actually bring in beneficial insects mm -hmm. like predatory wasps, you know, ladybugs to kind of um, make it to where we don't have to spray. And so it's a big balancing act because the more you know beneficials you add once your pest leaves, then your beneficial leaves. So you're trying to your your plants, mad scientists out there trying to determine you know the, mm -hmm. the ratio between good mm -hmm. and bad. Mm -hmm. And are there things that you um, will decide? Well, something's getting at uh, these collards, but it's not enough for me to do anything about it. Mm -hmm. How do you make those decisions? Uh, by well going through the field every day or every other day every day we walk through the fields and look and see what's going on if it's one or two plants on a row then we're not going to bother with it because some of our beneficial insects are going to come by and take care of that because we do uh, integrated pest management also uh, that's one of the biggest things that we implemented uh, probably four years ago and it's now really taking effect so we don't really don't have a big problem but if we do, we use vegetable base. It's, a, it's organic vegetable mm -hmm. base. Yeah. So there's this constant search to find enough of the uh, pests that you want to kill the pests mm -hmm. that you don't want. Yes. And ho hopefully that ratio um, stays, stays in tune. Mm -hmm. What about like uh, diseases that the plants might get, fung funguses and whatnot? Mm -hmm. Are you same, same boat? Mm -hmm. yeah. Same procedure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of different things you can spray in the grape world. Since um, we try to f follow organic practices, we don't really spray any fungicides, yeah. you know, but there are things that, you know, people can spray, you know, to kind of mitigate the fungus. What has been in the southeast, um, and depending on what season you're in, 
sometimes it can get way in front of you. And then you're, you're trying to stay up on the cost of spraying fungicides. It can be cost prohibitive to keep spraying. And that's yeah. where you have to make that determination by walking your fields and look at the crop and saying, is it too far gone? Can we spray it? And then, you know, kind of look at your books and determine, you know, what is that going to cost me in the long run? Right. And then is that going to get enough off the product to be able to really balance out the cost? Yeah. Now, are you picking by hand? Are you using mechanical pickers? And then talk about the process of marketing your product. How yeah. do you figure out who to sell it to? And how do you know when the price is right? We, uh, we hand harvest everything. We do not use those mechanical devices. We had this year, uh, one of the organizations made the vines involved with do have mechanical devices that you could rent or lease and I would think uh, we might pursue that in the future right now we use hands things of that there we um, both of us have been involved in going to buyer grower meetings meet with different uh, wholesalers and retailers outlets and different things of that there so again to go into them markets you got certain government regulations you got to follow you know, the good agriculture mm -hmm. practice you know gap and the harmony, different programs like that, you've got to be part of to be able to sell to the most wholesalers that feed to the university systems or any type of school systems or government systems. So some of your crop is sold before you actually put the seeds in the ground and the rest mm -hmm. of it you'll sell mm -hmm. once you know what your quantity is? Yes. Mm -hmm. We, um, there's uh, our farm to table program that we're, right now we're negotiating with, they, state that they might have 600 boxes and they allow certain farmers certain percentages of boxes things like that there we right now we don't that's the only csa we're involved with might be some more in the future anything different on yours yeah so we do uh since we do grapes we do a pick your own so you can come out to the farm and the consumer can pick their own grapes that cuts out on our labor costs and it has families to be able to enjoy agriculture um, and we do sell uh, to CSAs, uh, retail, and at farmers markets. And so with the grapes, it's a little different because you, um, you're expecting a certain amount of crop and just depending on the season, it will depend on how much you market to each one of those avenues. Connie, you, you, you have your hands in so many different kinds of things. <laughs> Talk about a typical day on the farm for you. What are the different kinds of things you're doing? When are you up? When is the farm day over? A uh, typical day, can, day for me can start sometimes at 5 o'clock in the morning. During the summer times, that's usually when we start. And we might start with picking peas or uh, breaking okra. And once we pick the peas, our customers, most of our customers want them shelled and they, they want them prepared and ready to eat or ready to cook. Uh, then once we get them picked, we'll, I'll carry them and get them shelled and packaged up and our customers come and get them. Usually by then, it's one o'clock, it's time for lunch. Then after that, I'm making jellies or jams or making kombucha, I'm making fire cider, I'm gathering herbs, I'm making tinctures. I do lots of different things and all of it I enjoy. Mm -hmm. And what about you, Miller? Tell me about your uh, day. Sometime, I'm been trying some of my buddies' ideas of working real late at night. I do go out, like she was saying, we do go out. I do go out earlier than she do. Sometimes I go out between three and four. It's the amount of heat. Certain vegetables you want to harvest when the heat, they mm. got very little heat into the mm. plant, the vegetable, and, that, and it stores a lot better. So I would go out earlier. We try not to do any harvesting of vegetables at 11 o'clock. So no you got later. flashlights going and? Mm -hmm. We're, we're mm -hmm. headlamps. Mm -hmm. Headlamps? Yeah, I think we go where that we go out there and, and just uh, like I say, and also you can see your pest load at the break of the daylight. Uh, you could, a lot of your mosses is out, a lot of your pests that lays the eggs for the worms and different things is in your field. So you really know the amount of insect pressure you've got by doing that monitoring and everything. And what about a day on your farm? Yeah, for me, uh, we harvest all at night, you know, because sugars um, are stored at night in the grape, and so we harvest. They're only typically uh, from 8 p.m. to about 8 a.m. So they have an off-the-farm job. Um, we have to get up early, you know, walk through the vineyard, you know, see how everything is, and I'm off to work. And then my day back on the farm, you know, comes on when I get off from work and do the same thing again. Hmm. Tell me something that um, non-farmers um, need to know about sustainable or organic farming, but they don't. I think the, the, to be able to know your farmer not just to read the label, labels can be very misleading. And I think that if the consumer can have a, a better consciousness on who the farmer is and what they do on their farm, 
I think they have a better understanding of, you know, how hard it is to be a farmer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Some of said some of our customers will come to the farm to get collards. Well, I want to see the field, so they follow us to the field mm -hmm. and uh, and see how it grows. And a lot of people don't realize how food exactly grows in a farm setting. Mm -hmm. Are there any new techniques that you guys have been researching and learning about that maybe you're thinking about deploying soon? Yes, we um. We looked at different type of mechanical devices to help us uh, set out to certain plants. One of the things is is the labor. Men Devon deals a lot with the labor that you really ain't mm -hmm. going to have it. You really need a, they go into certain markets, you need a, a larger volume than basic farming will give you. And one of the things about sustainable farming is that it, it's the only thing we're trying to really get a better understanding on it's designed for sustaining your needs and very little expansion. It is not designed to do traditional farming, sustainable farming. You really had to ramp that up. So what we looked at this year is uh, more in devices that help set out certain vegetables in the no-till situations. Because we think that the reduced amount where conventional farming goes across the field five to six times, no-till goes across twice, and that's it. So time savings as well. Time and time fuel. And fuel. You guys mm -hmm. talked about getting together and sharing some common techniques. How, is there a community of sustainable and organic farmers to where you share ideas? We, it's really just a farmer association. We, we, we've got a farmer association that we're part of. And each farmer's got a different way that he likes to farm. You know, some of them wants to farm sustainable ways, some of them farms in the traditional farming. Even raise their vegetables different ways. So. What's the best thing about being a farmer? having good food yeah having very good food to eat every day yeah. yeah to me that's the same thing it's it's the knowing that the food that you consuming where it comes from how it was made and whether how, how it should affect your body the nutrition wise i think the best thing for me is being able to uh, have opportunity to feed my community i think it means a lot for me to be able to see the the faces who come out to the vineyard and be able to know your neighbor and be able to uh, make sure that they have access to healthy food. Yeah. There's mm -hmm. got to be something Absolutely. great about getting out in fields where mm -hmm. you harvested uh, a year ago, you put the new seeds in, you know, you've checked all of this and to see it all grow and then get that satisfaction yeah. of, mm -hmm. of feeding not only your own family, but, but others as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been a great discussion. I'm really thankful that you guys came and introduced us to a lot of really interesting and important terms about where agriculture is going. Thanks for joining us today on Impact. We hope you'll tune in next time for the next edition as well.